In today's episode, we're going to talk about a topic which comes up in almost every system design interview, load balancers. So from previous system design videos, uh, you already know that you should go through the layers when you talk about a system design you're just coming up with. And at some point, you're going to talk about a load balancer. Load balancers, um, not in every interview, it's, uh, you're supposed to talk about them in more detail, but it's always good to know more about a certain technology. Let's start off with defining what a load balancer actually is. So, as the name implies, a load balancer takes load, which are requests from users using your service, and it routes that traffic to different backend servers. Um, there can be a lot of reasons for that. Mostly, it's to shift traffic and evenly distribute traffic between your backend machines. Um, also, it takes care of routing traffic geographically between the servers in your backend. There can also be legal reasons why companies have to route traffic which is coming from a certain geographical area um, to a certain data center which is in the same geographical area. Okay, let's talk about the types of load balancers. Uh, a quick disclaimer here, I'm not going to talk about every load balancer or every type of load balancer that's out there and I'm not going to talk about every algorithm that load balancers use. So those are the most common ones probably and some of them you would need to know of in an interview situation maybe but don't expect completeness from this video. So a common load balancing technique can be to load balance on layer 4 of the OSI networking stack, uh, which is the networking layer. So you load balance uh, based on the packages you're receiving. So a quick example would be you have one load balancer which takes all traffic globally and the load balancer which is only doing level 4 um, load balancing takes a look at the IP address and the port where this request is going to. Now, the load balancer um, keeps tables of IP ranges and it will know that because that user is in a certain IP range and because that user is requesting port 80, for example, it's forwarding that request to one backend service. Another common type of load balancing happens at the application layer, which is uh, layer 7 in the networking stack. And that means the load balancer is aware of, for example, the HTTP protocol and it can look into the HTTP request, let's say into the HTTP headers and makes its decisions based on the content of headers. Um, this is the advantage compared to layer 4 routing that the load balancer uh, will be able to route requests to the same backend services um, even if the, if the request is going to the same um, IP and port because it will know um, where this, this request is actually going. So for example, you could have uh, two HTTP servers running on one backend server, uh, both on port 80 for example, and the request um, will be routed to the right server based on the HTTP headers. And there's another option you can use for load balancing and that's DNS uh, load balancing, meaning on the layer of the translation from the URL to an IP address, um, you can make the decision where to route this request to. So Google, for example, is making heavy use of this because they you know, get a lot of traffic from all over the world and they want to route that traffic to the closest data centers possible. Okay, so there was a lot of theory. Let's do a real world example. Uh, this example is from a book published by Google, which is about site reliability engineering. I'm going to put the link in the description. Um, check it out, it's, uh, it's really useful information. In this example, there is a user making a request to a service called Shakespeare. And Shakespeare does a couple of things with um, some lookups based on text. It's not too important what the service actually does. We're interested in how the load balancing uh, in this example works. So in this example you will see a couple of techniques for load balancing used in conjunction and that's usually how this is done for big scale applications. Now the user makes a first request to this Shakespeare server, let's say it's a GET request to retrieve whatever information. Um, of course this request goes to DNS servers, in this case Google has own DNS servers so it can do all sorts of magic in there. 
Um, so Google gets this DNS request um, and Google needs to know or that DNS servers needs to know where to route that traffic to. Now it contacts a Google owned load balancer which here it's called GSLB and that load balancer uh, knows about the state of all the machines in the in the Google space so it knows because it's doing health checks and this kind of stuff it knows which data centers are up and which which machines are up um, and on which of those machines um, this Shakespeare service is actually running and ready to take traffic so GSLB will pick um, the right um, reverse proxy and it will um, route that request to this GFE which is a reverse proxy. So the Google DNS server in this example will um, reply to the user with the right IP address which points to this reverse proxy. In this case it's called GFE and GFE is a reverse proxy which does um, essentially one thing which in this case is it acts like the only front end this user is uh, communicating with. Meaning it takes this user's request and it terminates the SSL connection, for example. Meaning it takes this HTTP request and it unwraps it. And from here on and further back in the, in the Google infrastructure, it's not uh, an SSL request anymore. It's maybe converted to a uh, remote procedure call. And um, this reverse proxy will in that case take this request, make it into an RPC call and calls the application frontend. So the application frontend is a machine which um, represents this Shakespeare service. So this reverse proxy needs to know which application frontend to um, route this RPC call to. So again, the reverse proxy calls the load balancer, GSLB, and the load balancer, because it knows about the state of the whole uh, universe, so to say, it will pick a application frontend server which um, can take this request. So it will, GFE will take that request and send it to application frontend. And application frontend is um, one of the servers which represents this Shakespeare service. And the application frontend represents the Shakespeare service itself. So now we are in a service which maybe a team of developers wrote. Um, so the application frontend will take this RPC call, will do whatever it needs to do, and it calls a backend server uh, or a database directly, or it will call other services inside of the Google uh, network um, or whatever company we're talking about. So in this example here, it's making a call to the backend and the backend is um, querying a set of databases. Um, it does some transformation, aggregation of data, whatever, and it will return the result of this request to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy again is gonna route it back to the user. So in this example, we talked about a real architecture, um, still on a high level, but this is how it looks in, in, in real world. Now, we need to talk about the central piece of the load balancing, namely, um, how does the load balancer know uh, which request to forward to which backend service or backend server? Um, first of all, the load balancer will need to know which machines are available to take those requests and also um, which machines are healthy and not overloaded. And this is usually done with so-called health checks, meaning um, the load balancer makes requests um, like similar to ping requests to the, to the servers and those reply with, its, uh, with their state. So they could say, I'm in a healthy state, I'm in an unhealthy state. Um, it will also measure things like latency. It will know where those backend services, uh, backend servers are placed geographically. Um, and it will keep this state, so th this uh, state of the universe um, in the load balancer's memory. And then as soon as a request comes in, uh, it will know which service is running on which server, uh, which of those is healthy and uh, which of those is ready to 
serve customers. So in detail, uh, the load balancer will pick uh, one server to which it will send the request and it can do that with different algorithms. So the, the easiest way and the most naive way of doing this would be to use a round robin algorithm, which means um, it will send requests in turn to all the servers which are available to serve that request. Of course, this has downsides. Um, so just imagine that there are five servers and um, the first two are in bad shape or overloaded with traffic. The load balancer will still um, send requests to the first two because they're, you know, it's their turn, so to say. Um, but it would be a lot better if it would skip server one and two and serve the traffic to the remaining servers. Another common technique is called least connections. That means the load balancer will keep an eye on every server and it will know how many uh, open connections that server has established at a given point in time. And this is oftentimes a delimiting factor in what a, what a machine can serve. So it will um, forward the requests to those machines which have a low number uh, of open connections. And now we're getting into the interesting topic of statefulness uh, when talking about load balancers. So imagine that your service is serving customers, but it needs to maintain state between multiple requests. If uh, your load balancer cannot make that guarantee, it will possibly serve every request to a different uh, backend server and that can throw off your application logic. So load balancers have to keep state um, in some cases and they will need to forward those requests to um, the same backend service if possible. How can I do that? So a very primitive way of doing this is uh, by using the source IP, meaning the load balancer takes a look at the source IP address and it builds a hash out of that source IP, meaning the, the IP address of the user. The load balancer picks a hash function based on the available backend servers and it can uh, process every IP address out there and map it to one of the available backend services. And in this uh, scenario, because this mapping um, of requests is based on the IP address of the user, which doesn't change usually, um, you can guarantee that the request is going to the same backend server for a given amount of time. And lastly, that brings us to the more advanced topics when it comes to load balancing. Um, continuing on the topic of statefulness with uh, load balancing, um, what happens if the number of servers changes, um, meaning backend services go down and others come up. Usually with a primitive hash function, um, you would need to rehash all the uh, state you have. That means um, every active relationship between a user and the backend service um, will be shifted to another, uh, another backend service by the load balancer. Uh, which is a bad user experience and which it, it can break uh, your application logic in the worst case. So um, one key concept here is um, the topic of consistent hashing, uh, which is an algorithm was uh, introduced a long time ago. I'm going to put the, the original paper in the description. That algorithm makes sure that whenever those cases come up, so meaning when there a, a remap needs to happen, that the number of um, active connections um, which need to be shifted to a different server is as small as possible. So in short, consistent hashing is a relatively stable uh, mapping mechanism and in the case of load balancing with state, um, we're using this property of the algorithm to um, guarantee the best possible user experience. And then another topic you can think about or read in that book I mentioned in the beginning. Um, load balancers, as we described them in this video, are a single point of failure. Meaning, if you have only one instance of a load balancer running, and the load balancer usually keeps uh, tables, so it can keep the state um, of ongoing requests and you know what the status of each backend service is, how can you alleviate that problem? How can load balancers be not your single point of failure? 
Okay, I hope you learned a little bit in this video. I certainly did myself when I was writing uh, the script for the video today. Um, it's an interesting topic and there is much more to explore. And it's one of those topics where you learn a lot when you actually have to use load balancers or when you have to write configurations for load balancing or reverse proxies. But anyways, um, this is today's video. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up. Um, tell me what you would like to see more in the comments. My name is Roman Lopez and this is Success in Tech.